Thank you, Richard, so much for joining me. So I'm Erin Gallagher, and I'm Chair of Acquisitions and Collection Services at the University of Florida Libraries. I'm also a member of the Charleston Directors Group. And one of my great joys every year is participating in the Charleston Leadership Interview Series because I get to speak with a lot of really interesting thought leaders in the industry. And I also get to ask a lot of questions about, you know, books you're reading and things that uh, that are just fun for me. So this is one of my great joys for the conference every year. And um, I'm just really excited to dig in. So Richard, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks very much, Erin. It's great to talk to you, a fellow Gallagher. Um, I'm Richard Gallagher. I'm uh, the president and editor-in-chief of Annual Reviews. And I guess I'm included in this because Annual Reviews um, recently purchased the uh, Charleston Hub, which includes the Charleston Conference. And so um, I'm, I'm sure you're interested in the reasons behind that and um, and maybe other things as well. So very nice to to be invited and I'm looking forward to it. Well, yes, that is great, but I also had selfish reasons because we share the surname and, and you know, it is the most powerful surname that I can think of around the globe. So that's <laughs> a, that was an ex exciting prospect for me as well. And Richard, also, I'll just uh, share that I know you were just interviewed by Tom Gilson um, for Against the Grain last November. So I'm trying to not trod over too much trodden ground, but Tom taught me pretty much everything I know about interviewing for Charleston. So um, yeah, I'm going to try to try to draw up some different questions for you, though. You probably get a completely different set of answers if you ask the same ones, because I don't really remember it. <laughs> and that's fine. I love that. Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. Um, so you have really been steeped in the world of scientific publishing, research and scholarship for your entire career. So what attracted you to the sciences at a young age in your early years? Um. I uh, I was good at mathematics at school, and I decided that I would um, be a mathematician, I guess. And um, I, when I went to university, I was invited to join the honours class at the end of the first term. I was in with a group of, I don't know, 15 or 18 other people, and we were given these uh, this different way of teaching, which was much more rapid. And I could see, this is like in the second term at university, in these lectures, everybody nodding and taking notes and all that. And I was sitting there thinking, I have no idea what's going on here. So it turned out that um, actually I wasn't a good, a very good mathematician and I had to make a bit of a change of plan. And I thought I might do chemistry, but I did some biology um, courses as well. And uh, we did incredible um series of lectures on the immune system and I just became I guess quite obsessed by by immunology um, so the idea that uh, whatever kind of um, infectious agent you might come across you've got a system in your body that can recognize and respond to that and get rid of that very powerful system that at the same time has to be kept in check so that it doesn't run run amok and and do damage to the to the regular workings of the body. With this, at that time, it was called self non self discrimination, and um, in the early days, it was almost as much like a philosophy as it was a science, working out how self and non self is defined. Um, and over a period, I guess I was uh, involved in immunology for about the first twenty years directly of my career. Um, doing my undergraduate project, doing a PhD, and then two postdocs. I mean, I was just it, completely immersed in 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 the immune system. It was it was the most fascinating thing to me. And um, during my second postdoc, I uh, actually I used to share a bench with uh, a, another um, immunologist, and she came in one day and told me, "Oh, I've got." I'm leaving the bench. I've got a job in publishing. I'm going to be the editor of a magazine called Immunology Today. Um, Immunology Today was a magazine that I'd got my parents to get me a subscription to as a Christmas present. That was how much I, I liked it. <laughs> and she got the job and she loved it, but, but she didn't stay in the job. We were at in Trinity College in Dublin and she decided to, it's probably too much detail, she decided to come back to Dublin 
um, for her love interest. Um, and uh, she arranged for me to replace her as the editor. So I became the editor of this. It, it was it was like Christmas every day. It was fantastic. Uh, not only was I able to read up about what all the um, latest things that were going on in, in immunology research, I was actually able to get to know uh, work with, edit, speak with all these leading researchers. And immunology was really at its peak. It attracted the best scientists from all different areas of of of, of science. Um, there was a loads of Nobel Prizes. It was just, it was incredible. Um, so that was how I moved from the bench into, into publishing. And that was, I guess, 20 some years ago. And I've just gone from different publishing jobs um since then almost always on the editorial side i i i i've mostly interfaced with researchers and and the science mm -hmm. um but some of the jobs including the current one i've had um more of a a business function uh but it's been incredibly enjoyable and um and rewarding personally uh intellectually rewarding uh, career for me. So I'd recommend it to anyone. Well, as someone who, uh, Matt, I, I am, I am math friendly, but not very good at math. And math was, was, and still is terrifying to me, even though I'm managing our library's budget. So, you know, we'll keep that quiet, but, um, that's, it's really impressive that, you know, what started as a love for math turned into, uh, career in publishing and you know it also goes to show like network you know you never know who you're sharing a bench with or sharing an elevator with or you know sharing a classroom with and and who can kind of clue you into an adventure that you never anticipated yeah you're absolutely right although you might be the only person on the planet i don't know who requested a, a subscription to immunology today as a christmas present i think that's a <laughs> uh, i mean it, it it's down to that one um Professor Hopkins, his name was, and he just, in a way that um, the other science lecturers didn't do and, and maybe don't do, he really, he made you really think about it and made it, he made it very personal. It was stories um, and it was stories of success and failure. It was, I, I remember it to to this day. It was, it, it was really important for me because I was at a bit of a loss as to what I might do. I really believe in the power of storytelling. Absolutely. If if something is a compelling story, then it can it can really take you a lot of places. Yeah, for sure. So bringing us back to the Charleston conference, can you share how you got involved with the conference in the first place? Sure. Um, as I say, I was my career was mostly dealing with uh, researchers and being in, on the editorial side, but. Um, uh, annual reviews, I have two roles, um, my full title, I glory in the title of um, president and editor-in-chief. And the editor-in-chief part is dealing with the with the committees that run the 51 journals that we have. And the president part is essentially being the CEO of the organization. And uh, it was it was through that component that I became involved with, with the Charleston Conference and in um, beginning to interact with librarians. I hadn't really um, uh, worked with or, or talked with librarians all that much in my career. But one of the first things that we that we did when I joined Annual Reviews was we went to tiered pricing. And that meant that, that I had to do a lot of um, justifying what we were doing and, and why and so on. And I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed um hearing what librarians were thinking and I felt, felt as if I, it gave me a new insight into into what I was in, into what my work was and um, the first time I went to Charleston was in 2016 oh. uh, I got I got an email from a librarian called Charlie Remy um, and he was putting together a panel on small publishers and the challenges that they faced in an era of um, of integration of, of, of publishers. And uh, I, th there was four of us involved in the session. It was a lunchtime session. I think it was 75 minutes or something like that. And there was, I'd say there was maybe a dozen people in the room. So I, I got a lot out of it actually because I learned a lot from the other people that were in the, 
that, that were in the session. And of course, it meant I was at this uh, librarian librarian publishing conference that I'd never been at before, and I really, really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed going to the sessions. I know people say that they go to network. I didn't really have much of a, a network to engage with, but I, I greatly enjoyed, um, first of all, being in Charleston and also all the, again, it, it's, it was like a, going into a sweetie shop. There was so many things that you could choose to, to go and hear about. A lot of it was new to me. And um, I really, I, I really got a lot of uh, value out of it. Um, annual reviews has been going to the Charleston conference for forever, um, as a vendor and and sometimes as um, uh, members of staff participating in sessions. But um, but I'd never been before that, um, and I I didn't actually go again until um, last year, twenty twenty two. And the reason I went then was that we had purchased the Charleston Advisor and um, I went to, you know, uh, we were thinking about what we would do with the Charleston Advisor and, and we'd started speaking to a lot of librarians and it was a great chance to go and, and just um, talk more about it and, um, and again to engage in and learn a lot about what was going on in, in from from a librarian perspective and and how librarians and, and publishers work together, and that was the first time that I met um, Katina Strout as well. So um, that was a real uh, that that was really fun, and uh, and then that led on to us um, purchasing the the Charleston Hub. Well, you've anticipated my uh, my next question, but also that really is the magic of Charleston. You know, is just um, getting. 12 people in a room together for lunch and having a, a frank and open discussion about something where you're getting the librarian, publisher, vendor, you know, uh, all sorts of perspectives all at once and in a very uh, informal setting. And plus Charleston's just lovely. Um, but so uh, acquiring the Charleston hub, you know, you, you mentioned that um, you were there last year when annual reviews acquired the Charleston advisor, but now you've acquired the Charleston hub, which includes the conference itself and against the grain. And I feel like you've probably been asked some variation of this question many times, but our viewers are interested to know why was this a good fit for annual reviews? Um, well, first of all, the, the Charleston um, advisor allowed us to dip our toe into into th this area and that really was it it was just something that um came about we were approached i guess a number of potential purchasers were approached uh, when the owners decided to to sell the the, the the charleston advisor and and i liked it because as i say i'd become interested in the uh in in the librarian community we'd started to, or at least I'd started to engage a lot more over models of open access and things like that. And I just felt that um, th this idea of a, a volume that was doing reviews for things that the library community were interested in was a good fit for an organization that published reviews on science, especially given the, um, the, the interdependence that librarians and publishers um have so it it was a it was an experiment really to buy the the charleston advisor actually an ex, it's an experiment that still hasn't um really gone as far as we would like it to go because we this annual review is a small organization and and we became very caught up in moving all of our content to open access and we kind of put the um the charleston advisor development on hold we're now in the position where we're taking that forward but it was interesting enough and the and the interactions with the librarian community were interested enough that um, when the conversation with Katina came around to um, what the future of the of the conference was that um, I, I thought it was an interesting thing for for me to talk to her about whether we would be a good fit and um over several meetings, we we decided, she decided, and and we decided on our side that that was indeed the case. Um, I think, uh, as I say, I think there's there, there's a we share a lot in in common. Uh, we have common goals, uh, the publishing community and the and the library community. Not to say that every librarian and every publisher agrees on 
hit every single question, but um, I think we're we're part of a, we're part of a continuum with uh, other groups as well to try and you know make sure that the knowledge that research is generating is is available, preserved, and of maximum utility to various audiences, and and so I think it's a really good fit. Mm -hmm. I could absolutely see that, and and you know you're talking about the uh, the the mission and the um, you know uh, uh, priorities toward open access, and I can share the annual reviews was our um, here at University of Florida. This was our entry into the subscribed open model for investing in in open access, and I really enjoy being a member of that subscribed open community of practice. Um, I I didn't know what to expect at first, and and you know I was a little nervous that maybe am I going to be out of my element here, um, but that isn't the case. It's a, I find it to be a very welcoming group, and also um, I come away from it learning or networking with you know learning something or networking with someone every time. But I'm wondering from the publisher perspective, what value do you obtain from that community? Um, huge value. Um, we um, started off with our open access program, subscribe to open. Um, it was really just a shot in the dark, I think. Um, we did it with just a couple of journals at the beginning and we did it as an experiment. And, um, you know, we started off with a particular, in the first year we gave discounts, for instance, on people that subscribed and so on. And it was really only through um, getting the feedback of, of the customers that, that the program was developed into something that really could be considered uh, a regular a, a regular business model. So the the development of subscribe to open has been really a partnership between um, us and other publishers, but very definitely with a group of librarians that that have helped um, consider our, our point of view, given their point of view, and and given us a lot of feedback. It's it's absolutely central to to how we work now and um you know you hear about all kinds of different uh nuggets of information in that meeting i think it's really it's really enjoyable it gives a lot of new connections and um yeah it's seven o'clock in the morning for me so and i and i always get up for it so i i think it, it shows that it's a really valuable mean it always sets off the day in a in a positive uh, frame of mind for me Oh, good, good. Okay. Well, I'll have to keep that in mind because it's 10 o'clock for me over here on the East Coast and, and uh, my brain is in full power mode at that point. So uh, good good on you for, you know, getting there at seven. So this is a, a bit of a longer question um, because I'm going to share one of your quotes. So when you were interviewed in Against the Grain in 2022, just last year, you shared that several other initiatives are in the earlier stages of development aimed at two-way interactions between climate change researchers and policymakers, business leaders and social influencers. Helping to bridge the gap between research and society on climate change is our way to meet the moment. And the extent of these efforts will depend on attracting new funding sources. Journal subscription income is used solely to support the production of journals. So we are exploring partnerships with technology, media, event, and publishing organizations to deliver more usable research knowledge and to counter misunderstanding, misinformation, and deliberate disinformation. So can you provide an update for us one year later on these initiatives? Sure. Uh, well, let me preface that by saying that uh, my mom always used to say to me, your eyes are bigger than your belly, by which she meant both that I used to eat more than than I probably should, but in general, I always um, I guess bit off more than I could chew is the is the other way of saying it, and um, and and we are very interested in in all of these things. So that's one thing to say, and the other thing to say is that I think one of the um, values of being a non profit organization is that when you try new things, there's no reason for them not to be done openly. So that other people can, in, in on the one hand, help improve them as the subscribe to open community of practice does, and on another hand, just be able to see and critique an approach that that's been taken, and the general um the general view that we have of annual reviews is not that when we publish the articles that's us done we publish a volume and 
and and that's the end of our and that's the end of our responsibility. I guess we see it as about halfway through the process. So in our case, we commission the articles, we have them edited, we publish them, but then we want to make sure that the impact of those articles is maximized and 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 we're developing a number of ways um, to do that one is uh, we have a general science magazine called knowable that takes review articles as a jumping off point and develops stories around them um, for um, public consumption and those those knowable articles the, the main readership of the knowable articles are through republication so they're republished in lots of different outlets including some quite prestigious ones, um, The Atlantic magazine, uh, Washington Post, Smithsonian magazine, um, some newspapers, USA Today, have published them, um, Bloomberg on the business side. There's there's any number of um, republication efforts. And, and it, they all lead back, before we were open access, they all led back to the deep dive of the review article, which we made open. Uh, when the knowable articles were published. Now, of course, it's all open. Um, but I think that that's not enough. And it's not enough to just have the content being open access because with the best will in the world, scientific reviews can be, they're, they're, they're not an easy read. Uh, there's a lot of um, jargon. They're long. They're, in some senses, tedious, <laughs> I suppose. So what what we what what I'm interested in doing is taking the information, not just from reviews, but from the scientific literature and making it usable to different elements in, in society. Uh, one of those is um is the business community. And we are in the early stages of a, a program with an investment bank that has a climate um policy unit. And that climate policy unit's job is to provide advice to the clients of of the of 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 the bank on what is going on in policy research and and how they might possibly respond to it. And um, they're using annual reviews articles on climate change. We're working with them. They're building in some economic indicators and so on, and that's presented to these. Um, C-suite level executives to give them some better insight into into uh, what's happening in the science of climate change. So I think that's one area. Uh, we also I'm really interested in um, understanding things like climate change beyond the the scientific components of it. And um, we've only done one of these, but we're planning to do a series of salon events where we bring together, the one that we did was in New York City. We had eight um, researchers on different areas of climate change. There was an oceanographer, there was a public health person, there was a sociologist, uh, a, bun a bunch of scientists came together with a bunch of non-scientists. And that included um, a poet, an artist, a religious leader, uh, someone from the office of the... Um, of, of the mayor of New York City, um, the, a representative of the investment bank, and a couple of young activists. And we all sat around for the, for the evening and talked about different ways of understanding and approaching and informing each other about climate change. And it was just really incredibly valuable. The idea that I had was that we would try to build these cells in different communities around the country of... Um, scientists and non-scientists that could that could respond to different issues around climate change, because if it just becomes siloed and here's what the science is telling you and doesn't include, here's what school teachers and activists are thinking, then you're not going to get the same buy-in. And for things like um, and not, not just climate change, but social justice issues, uh, um, uh, issues around um, food. Uh, nutrition and things like that. We we really need to get multiple different perspectives, and we want to be we want to make sure that the science component is is not outside of the rest of culture. So I think we're trying to embed it in that way. I've got this real desire to work with an organisation called C Forty Cities, which is the mayors of all the mega cities of the world, and they have a very serious program on climate change, and they've got a policy unit. And we've been talking to the uh, to the leaders of the policy unit about how 
annual reviews and annual review scientists might get to work with the mayors of these cities. Um, so there's we've we've got lots of things. Um, a couple of years ago, the board um, allowed us to take on a climate change fellow, and and that person, Shannon, her name is 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 leading our is leading all these various projects. In in a way, what we want is partners. We would love other publishers. We would love librarians to be interested in getting involved in these projects as well, because uh, one small publisher is not not going to move the needle all that much. We're making some progress. We've got lots of good ideas, and um, if it weren't for us being so small and and being focused, well, now on the Charleston conference, um, and still on subscribe to open, then we would be we would be much further ahead. I think. It still sounds like really valuable progress, and I love this idea of bringing together, you know, the scientists, publishers, teachers, activists. This is um, something that I think we in libraries really try to emphasize through information literacy instruction, which is that there are different modes of wisdom and you know different modes of uh, uh, knowledge and authority on yeah. a particular topic. And so I really like that that effort as well. Yeah. No, that that's one of the huge. Um, um, pluses of of working alongside librarians is that you get this insight and also for me I'd never um I'd never really thought about or talked to humanities publishers and humanities librarians and publishers you know I'm now beginning to in, engage with them for various reasons and and that's it's like a lifelong learning really in in your own job it's it, it, there's all there's so many things actually the problem is so many things to do doing a bunch of things badly doesn't really help anyone so having that discipline to focus on on what you can achieve is really important as well well in libraries there's no dearth of curiosity i think that's why i i got into this is because i i didn't want to i didn't want to leave the books of academia so now they're my friends forever so you're president and editor-in-chief at annual reviews and these are both roles that require intensive leadership so how did you learn leadership and who are some of the leaders who inspire you? I don't know that I've ever learned leadership. Um, we're, I suppose if, if I go back to my childhood, um, my parents and my dad was a lawyer. And so he liked, he encouraged um, argument. <laughs> um about everything really and um and and uh making your point in a in in a fair and uh in a way that 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 was reasonable uh, so he was a big influence i think my next door neighbor actually when i was growing up my next door neighbor was involved in publishing he well he was the he was the manager of a printing factory and he uh he was very thrilled when I went into publishing. Actually, he was a he was a lovely man, and um, I learned a, a lot from him. Uh, actually, at some point, I guess when I was in my late teens or something, his a company was bought by Robert Maxwell, and I saw firsthand the impact that bad management could have on 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 the life of someone who was an expert in his field. He really became very distressed in that period which which led him to retire but he Mr Munn, he was a he, he was someone uh I, again are are just very reasonable and uh, listen I think that that's the kind of approach that I like I like a very flat structure publishing is good for that because and science is very good for it because it's a it's a battle of ideas and and likelihoods um, so I really like that. I don't really like a hierarchical approach. Obviously, any kind of management, there's some kind of hierarchy, but I think, A, I really like any explanations to be, any decisions to be fully explained. And B, I really like the people that I work with and I myself like to do a broad range of things. So I like to edit from time to time. And they don't let me near <laughs> my scripts to edit anymore. But I still like doing that. Um, I like doing sales calls. I, I I just like the whole the whole thing, and I don't I don't like a, a command type um, um, approach to management either. I don't like to do it, and I don't like the people that work with me to do it either. I like everybody to 
to be embedded. And I feel that um, at annual reviews, we've got a very flat structure um, and we, on project by project, we try to bring people from different areas uh, of, of the organization and different levels of experience um, into, into the picture. Um, so that would be the, I mean, I think it's relatively easy to do in, in a non-profit, I think, and it's not so easy, especially at one of the big for-profit companies, you've got primarily responsibilities to, to shareholders or owners or investors. Um, we're very mission driven and, um, and that really, that really suits how I like to, to work. So I don't know if that, um, other people, you know, just some really good, my, my PhD, when I, when I did my PhD, I had two friends that there were three of us did the PhD together and the other two had the same supervisor. And when they went in in the morning, they would have a meeting, a daily meeting with their supervisor. Well, you do this today. I'm going to do that. Let's see your data. For me, the, my supervisor was the head of the department and I had a meeting with him once a week where he would expect me to tell him what I'd done. And I would say, well, I've done this and you know it hasn't worked and I'm a bit stuck. And he would never say, well, why don't you do X or Y? So why do you think that? And huh? what are you going to do about it? And I used to think... Like, I'd made a really terrible choice of supervisor. <laughs> but it turns out that, um, you know, that really makes you um, look at the issues that you're facing and and try to think through what your, what a solution would be that you can come up with, not not wait and hear what the expert is going to tell you or um, not be restricted by what the received wisdom is. And I think that's a really good way. And I think, you know, when, when we were looking at um, how we would move to open access uh, for annual reviews, the APCs just didn't work, uh, read and publish didn't work, and we just, we had to find a different way of doing it, well, or we had to find someone who had a different way, and we did that through uh, working with Rame Crow, but um, it, it wasn't dissimilar to the approach that my supervisor took in my PhD. I will say, however, I turned out to be a terrible scientist <laughs> at the bench because I just didn't. I never quite. I never quite got that level of uh, of training. But in other ways, it was it was. Or actually, I probably was untrainable anyway. Uh, but in other ways, it was uh, it was a real advantage. Well, and I do think that's a hard leadership lesson to to learn, which is that uh, so much of it is knowing the good questions to ask and knowing when to just listen and return. So, so th this, these are a couple of fun questions. This is the fun part for me uh, because I, I like to ask things as a, a book nerd myself. Um, what's the best book you've read this year? It depends on what you mean by best. If you mean the one- What was that... your most enjoyable, the book that gave you the most enjoyable reading experience this year? Um, all right. So most enjoyable, there's a, there's a trilogy. Actually, there's four books by- uh, um, very amusing Irish author. Uh, I've got the book here actually, Keeve McDonnell, and this is the first in the series. Um, a man with one of those faces. It's just a riot, really. Uh, all and there's four books. So you sometimes when you read a book that you think, oh, I wish that would never end. Well, there's another three to read, and I read through them, you know, far too quickly. They're just really fun. Um, it captures the kind of um, absurdity and and um that a very irish view on on life and how things happen uh, so you would love it mm -hmm. um and uh, i think that that's a that's a really a really good series of books and and real escapism so that would be what i would pick as a, as the highlight of the year and there that's the kind of thing i'm really drawn to in my reading um I have to confess, I don't, you know, I, I don't read as much um, real heavy literature as I should. I know that it, I know that I would get a lot out of it, but I use it for relaxation and entertainment and fun. And these books are are great. So when you're not, you know, leading the charge in annual reviews or reading, uh, what do you like to do in your spare time? And in particular, I did see in a prior interview that you mentioned hiking. So I wondered if you had any hiking trips coming up. Yeah, we, um, we're going away after after um, Christmas time uh, around New Year. We're doing a few days up in uh, Mendocino, 
and we'll be doing some good hiking up there. It's a real, one of the real pleasures of living where I live is that there's there's great hiking and it's year round. And it's kind of hiking for softies because it never gets very cold or <laughs> you're never taking you're never taking a weather risk really, except if it gets really hot, I suppose. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, when I go to Scotland and I I go hiking with my sister and my brother in law, it's like a different experience. They're, you know, so they've got so so much uh, safety equipment and they're using compasses and maps and all that, and I just follow it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I'll be doing I really like that um, I really like running I run probably five times a week and um, and I must say if you go to a new place uh, either a city or or in the countryside the best way of of seeing around the area is just to go out for a run and if you go at my speed it's probably more a jog if I would say than a run and so you get to see you know the architecture or or the scenery and and it, it, it's really it's really great and you're keeping yourself fit so I do a lot of hiking and a lot of running mm -hmm. um I don't know I like I like music I was out at a concert last night I like I do quite a lot of travel because our committee meetings are are usually in person and I go to a lot of those and I like to go to jazz small jazz clubs when I travel mm -hmm. find the what would formerly have been a kind of smoke-filled basement. It's not a smoke anymore. But you can still get a whiskey and listen to some some music and usually get chatting to someone. So I wouldn't say that I'm a connoisseur of of that, but I really like to go and and hear um live music in a, a small venue. I don't go to a lot of uh, big arenas for for concerts, but I like like that kind of intimate music experience. I like your conference style for sure. I'm also a fan of going for a run, which my running is very, it might as well be a fast walk. It's like a, a you know, fast walk run. Um, but what concert did you go to last night? Oh, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it was um, a carpenter's Christmas. So there's this um, couple that are, they have a show in Vegas and um, they, they do uh, a Christmas special based on two TV shows that the Carpenters did in the 1970s, which I've never seen. Um, but I know the Carpenters, and I was assured that the the girl has got a voice that's very like Karen Carpenter. And it was, it was just a very enjoyable, light show. Actually, the highlight for me was um, the guy that was playing Richard Carpenter did a piano piece where they they had screens as well so they showed a lot of uh, visual images and he did a big long segment from the Charlie Brown Christmas special oh, I love that um, and, and there was a little band there as well like an eight piece um, mini orchestra it was just it was just very charming well, that sounds amazing. And don't be embarrassed. I'm pretty sure I have that album, The Carpenter's Christmas, and it's it will be played this Christmas. So, um, so the the question I always end with is a question that um, my, you know, interview mentor, Tom Gilson, always ended with, which is, is there anything you wish that I'd asked that I didn't? I wish it had been more of a conversation and I'd been able to ask you, but maybe we'll reverse the roles some other time. I like that. I like that idea. I like that. But, and as I said at the beginning, I really think that we should have been doing this in a bar in Donegal. I agree. I agree. Next time. Next time. But thank you so much, Richard. This has been wonderful. Thanks a lot, Erin. Okay. Have a great holiday. You too.